state of perpetual endless war when you continue to assume that war will get you out of it. This is Fortress on a Hill. Thank you for joining us. I'm Henry. And I'm Danny. Now, let's get started. Professor of History and the Director of Chapman University's Master's Program in War and Society. He joined the Chapman University faculty after having served as the Chief of the American History Division, my boss, in the Department of History at the United States Military Academy at West Point. He's a retired U.S. Army Colonel. He has served in both Operations Desert Storm and Iraqi Freedom. Data specializes in the history of the Vietnam Wars and the Cold War era. He has authored four books, most recently, Withdrawal, Reassessing America's Final Years in Vietnam, and then 2014's Westmoreland's War, Reassessing American Strategy in Vietnam, and 2011's No Shore Victory, Measuring U.S. Army Effectiveness and Progress in the Vietnam War. He's also published several op-ed pieces commenting on current military affairs and strategy to include writings in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the L.A. Times, and National Interest Magazine. Full disclosure, uh, Colonel Daddis was my boss and mentor when we both taught at West Point, so any factual errors, faulty conclusions, or general failings on my part are really his fault, so (laughs) keep that in mind. (laughs) Well, uh, thanks for being with us, Greg. Yeah, it's a privilege. Thanks so much for having me on. Still uh, still weird calling you by your first name, but uh, it's growing on me. All right, that's good. See, that's, that's what we call winning, Henry. That's right. That's right. All right, sir. Well, uh, Greg, will you uh, – so I know you don't like talking about your own uh, career, which is uh, one of the reasons I like you, but would you mind giving us just a, a brief rundown of your personal career path and you know what the most influential and meaningful assignments were for you? Uh, sure. Yeah, it's a uh, – you want to start with a conversation in mediocrity, I see. So. Uh, <laughs> I prefer that. Right. Uh, so I, I went to West Point, graduated in 89, uh, commissioned as an armor officer, uh, yet never served in armor battalion. I was uh, serving cavalry units uh, for all of my operational assignments. And then just had the good fortune of uh, kind of bouncing back and forth between uh, West Point and the operational army and having an opportunity to uh, not only serve in the in the field army, but then kind of bring those uh, lessons back into the academy and um, and for me, I think that was the, the best part of it was to kind of go back and forth and, um, and really be able to take some of the perspective that I had learned in the field force and, and bring that back to West Point. Um, in terms of the, I think, most meaningful assignment, I would say I was immensely fortunate because I found that the best assignment I had um, and, and I think this was fortunate, was always seemed to be the one that I was in. And I think that's probably why I stayed in as long as I did. So, um, you know, I was fortunate to have a great platoon as a platoon leader and, and a cavalry troop commander in 3rd ID at Fort Stewart. Um, I learned an incredible amount as an S3 in a cav squadron in Korea. Um, saw a completely different side of the Army uh, as a command historian in Iraq and, and obviously – um, it's just a immense honor and, and privilege to, to be in the faculty at West Point. And, and the reason I, I wanted to just start off with that, I, um, this idea of the best assigned being the one I was in, because I, I actually had a boss who um, we were talking about assignments, and, and he said that uh, he was kind of reflecting on his own career and, and said that he, it was just one assignment he had, and uh, it was 10 years ago, and he was kind of talking wistfully about this great assignment I had. and. And as he was talking, it, it was kind of sad in a sense, right, that his best right. assignment was almost a decade ago, and yet he had stayed in the Army. And um, and so I think that it was kind of a lesson for me, both professionally and probably more importantly personally, that um, you know the best thing you're doing should be the thing you're doing right now in the moment. 
as opposed to something you did five, 10 years ago. And um, so for me, it was, it was just a good learning moment as, a, as both an officer and I think just as a, as a person to, um, to relish the moment you're in and, and not um, you know, be beholden to some assignment you had five, 10 years ago. Yeah, it's uh, pretty common for, you know, some officers to sort of live in the past and uh, be caught up in whatever they presume their glory days were. But it's just a great attitude to have. And it was clear to me when you were, you know, division head at West Point that you loved doing what you were doing there. And then that just kind of like filtered through the entire unit. So that's my uh, that's the smoke up your ass for the day. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's such a great point. And I remember reading your. Your not your first book. Well, yeah, your first book on Vietnam, No Shore mm-hmm. Victory, when I was in grad school. And I knew you were at West Point. I didn't know you were going to be uh, leading the division that I was in at that time. And I found myself thinking, you know, why is he studying this? I mean, obviously, Vietnam is super interesting. I mean, people read books about it all the time. But but as he went into like the academic field right. uh, and did some real scholarship, why did you choose the Vietnam War? You know, what kind of led you to this topic? Initially, I didn't. I, uh, I got my master's degree at Villanova and, and had the opportunity to work with Russell Wigley, who was in at Temple, kind of the, um, one of the father of American military history studies. Had wrote the uh, obviously incredibly influential the American Way of War. And uh, so while I was there, I actually did a lot of work on the interwar period. And it wasn't until I got back to West Point in uh, 2003, that um, 2004, that it was part of a study as the U.S. Army was then kind of engaging in, um, should I say, the liberation of Iraq, the, the voluntary liberation of Iraq. <laughs> uh, we were, it turned out well, I heard. Uh, but as we were moving into Iraq, and, um, we, uh, and I was at West Point at the time, there was a special forces group commander that had written back to West Point, uh, along with a number of other commanders, they were kind of using West Point as, a, as an opportunity to write some historical case studies that might help commanders think about some of the problems they were engaging in Iraq. And this special forces group commander was on a second tour, and he wrote back asking for some um, historical case studies on how to measure progress and effectiveness in an unconventional environment. And a colleague of mine got together, and, and I did uh, the Vietnam case study, um, U.S. Army in Vietnam. He did the French experience in the French Indochina War. And uh, it was really eye-opening in the sense that um, the narrative that was throughout much of the scholarship on Vietnam was so at incredible odds with what I was seeing in just the, the short amount of research I was doing for this project. So uh, when I was given the opportunity to stay on at West Point and then go to the um, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, to get my, dis- uh, my Ph.D., um, it just was a natural fit to kind of explore why the narrative, the accepted narrative of, of body counts being the, the sole metric of a, an army that was wedded to this conventional concept that all it cared about was killing the enemy um, because it had no other scorecard like geography, as an example, in World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, that that was just it was wrong. That the documents said, in fact, just the opposite. That, that the army was engaged in this um, overarching attempt to measure progress and effectiveness in combat, in development issues, in the economy, in in the political contest in the countryside and in the urban centers. And and what I found was, in fact, just the opposite of what the histories were, were saying. That it wasn't just body count that was the metric. That in fact, the army was. Um, engaging in this 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 data collection effort, effort that just consumed them. And so it, to me, it said something larger about the problem of Vietnam, and that's why I've stayed so interested since, is that it's such contested history, right, that there's there's debate on nearly every aspect of this war. And, and a lot of that debate then turns into a contest over not just the memory of the Vietnam War, but I think the memory of, of who we are as Americans and our, our very identity, that there's debates about patriotism and a sense of, of who we are as Americans at home and abroad. Um, there's clearly a um, debate that continues to rage about whether we won or not, or whether the war was winnable. There's, there's issues, I think, about the limits of power, which you and I both have talked about um, in more current day affairs that we're wrestling with. So to me, um, the reason why I've stayed with Vietnam, I think, because 
it, it offers so much and because it's such a hotly debated um, moment in our time that continues to resonate throughout the decades. Yeah, especially within the military, which kind of got me thinking, you know, you graduated West Point in 1989. About what percentage of your, you know, tactical officers and instructors at the time were Vietnam veterans? And what was the prevailing narrative or the influence of Vietnam on those officers? Yeah, it was palpable. I mean, I, heck, when I, uh, when I would deploy to Desert Storm, I still had a scout um, section sergeant that was a, a Vietnam veteran. And so I had a number of professors, uh, especially senior academy professors that were Vietnam veterans, the head of the history department, Bob Doty was a veteran. Um, the superintendent, Dave Palmer, was, was a Vietnam veteran. In fact, I remember in our history of the military art course my senior year, we read Palmer's Summons of the Trumpet. Wow. which tells a very specific story about Vietnam. And much of it is this triumphal narrative that the U.S. Army had succeeded on the battlefield, that it um, that there was this kind of stab in the back theory that um, despite these battlefield victories in Vietnam, uh, that the American home front had turned against the, the Army, uh, that the media was complicit in, in this kind of anti-war activism that was pervasive at the time, um, that these weak need politicians had had, um, had pulled us from victory right at the moment when when we were on the cusp of, of all out success. Um, so it was very much a part of who I was growing up in the um, in the 1980s as a cadet, and and all of that um, I think filtered into um, how we saw ourselves at the end of the Cold War, uh, because I think that Vietnam syndrome was still very much prevalent. And by the time I was a cadet and graduated in 2005, there, I think there was only two Vietnam or three Vietnam veterans left in the entire faculty. And it was essentially the, the dean and uh, the head of the history department who was still there, Colonel Doty, that you, you spoke of. But I remember being assigned Harry Summers' book on strategy uh, as a cadet in 2004, which really spoke to that same sort of uh, we could have won or uh, and, and if we had only have. done more. Right, should have won. And if only we had had a better strategy, uh, if only we were more uh, perceptive of, of the actual contours of the conflict, that we, we would have won that war and should have won that war. And, and that was the, the key takeaway. Uh, and I remember graduating West Point and, and having officer professional development sessions, and, and Summers was still very much a part of the conversation even into the 90s. Yeah, it, it really is wild. And, and, that, and that's why we wanted to talk to you at this time um, about memory, hmm. you know, historical memory with the scholars, but maybe more importantly, the, just the public memory of Vietnam. And you've already touched on this a little bit, but you know, could you lay out for us just some of the, the, the general themes that have uh, continued throughout the years as, as to how Vietnam has been remembered and specifically myths and inaccuracies that are most common. And you've mentioned some of them, but maybe just, yeah. just lay it out a little more clearly. Well, I, I think that's in part the, the challenge of, of studying Vietnam and, and also I think the I mean, personally the um, the value of studying Vietnam is that in a sense there is no one singular collective memory um, that the the public memory of Vietnam even the professional historian memory of Vietnam um, it that's a battlefield in and of itself and there are so many landmines out there when we think about what Vietnam means for us and um, in part, I think that collective memory is contested because there are so many constituencies at odds with each other, right? Uh, you've got anti-war activists um, who, who saw this conflict as immoral and if not illegal. You saw journalists who were trying to get a sense of, of what we were doing um, in Southeast Asia and, and seeing dichotomies ranging from, you know, the rural population to the, the urban centers in Saigon and, and other major cities, um, hearing what, what soldiers were saying and, and those reports from the field being at odds with MACV headquarters. Um, you see officers uh, like Harry Summers and Dave Palmer who were looking back on the war um, and still look back on the war as, again, this, this kind of Great, great crusade that um, this noble cause, as Reagan coined it. Um, if only we had civilian policymakers who were able to stick it through. 
Um, you see the policymakers themselves who, um, in their memoirs and, and other writings, are, are trying to demonstrate that this was an important war, that it was a war that, that um, needed to be fought in the larger Cold War cons construct. And then obviously, I think you see the veterans themselves who are trying to establish a certain memory of the war um, to, to help make their sacrifices make sense. And, um, and for those sacrifices to have meaning. I mean, just think about the debate over the Vietnam Wall itself, right? That, mm. um, that just how we determine to memorialize this conflict um, is incredibly contested. In fact, the wall doesn't suffice at the end that we have to have another monument besides the wall, the, the three soldiers next to the wall to demonstrate um, our, our appreciation for the sacrifices of the individual soldier. Um, and so I think this is important for us um, in two ways. I, I think the first is we need to be really, really careful as we look back on episodes like Vietnam. And I would argue as we move increasingly farther away from the, the first decade of our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, that myths that come out of these wars are oftentimes based on a reductive view of history. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if you look at, say, senior officers like Admiral um, Ulysses S. Grant Sharp, who is the right. Pacific Commander, Pacific Command Commander, um, you know, his title of his book is Strategy for Defeat. Um, so there's very much a storyline in there that, that if only senior officers were allowed to fight the war, that they uh, knew how to fight, that we would have won. Um, or others who will simply blame uh, Westmoreland as example for having a wrong strategy, um, or Jane Fonda for being uh, the traitor she was and turning the American public against the war, or the, the media themselves at fault. It, I think when you those myths are all based on a reduction of history to a to single point failures, right? If only Westmoreland had a better strategy. If only Jane Fonda continued to you know, make Barbarella movies. Um, if only the media was more, more patriotic, um, we would have won. And so, you know, these myths oftentimes turn into a search for blame. There's, there's, there's some similarities here, I think, with a, a lost cause um, approach to history that you find um, with Confederate veterans in the aftermath of World War, I mean, of the Civil War. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's another historical case study that's uh, amazingly after 150 years still contested you know you mentioned the stab in the back uh, myths that developed especially among a lot of US military officers and sort of the uh, would have could have should have won narrative you know you mentioned that they're reductive and that they uh, that they continue to this day that they're pervasive you know to push a bit further what what exactly is so problematic or dangerous about these pitfalls of yeah. memory you know how, how does it how do you think it affects us today so there's this great uh episode in uh kaplan's the insurgents uh which is about the, the petraeus um uh and mafia is not the right word but the you know those those coin approach advocates um that uh and the study of kind of the the writing of the new counterinsurgency doctrine. And Kaplan lays out this piece. There's a, a, a Bush White House senior advisor, and he he's visits Iraq, and on the plane ride home, he's reading Lewis Orley's A Better War. And as he's reading A Better War, he has this kind of aha moment, right? That, yes, the war is bad in Iraq. Yes, things are going uh, not as planned. Yes, the American home front seems to be turning against the war. But we have a historical precedence here that if we look back to Vietnam, we're in this post Tet 1968 moment, right? And, and the same history is now in front of us where uh, General George Casey gets to play the role of William Westmoreland by, by fumbling through a, a bad war. Uh, we have a, a difficult moment in both wars and then the savior general comes along in the form of David Petraeus or in the case of Vietnam, Creighton Abrams, 
and the war is turned around to the point where we are right on the cusp of achieving victory. And so to me, this is the danger of, of misreading and reducing history, um, because that's, in fact, not what happened. That, that when Westmoreland is moved to the become the chief of staff of the army and Abrams takes over command, there is no brand new war winning strategy that is put in place. He, he does not alter the trajectory of the war in, in any semblance at all. There is no new strategy that is implemented. There is no um, completely different approach that, that takes a losing war and puts it on the path to, to ultimate victory. And yet that's exactly the, the, the storyline that is told um, by the senior White House staffer that gives this gives support for the surge historical credence. And so to me, that's the danger of kind of misreading certain lessons that come out of the history of Vietnam. That if we think that in this incredibly complex conflict, that one senior officer who is a tank commander in Patton's army in World War II has very limited counterinsurgency background. Um, yes, is Westmoreland's deputy chief, uh, deputy um, commander for a year, so understands a bit of the complexity of, of the war in which he's fighting. But to to believe the narrative where one man, one American man, can come in and miraculously turn around a war in a matter of hours um, sorely makes the contention that, that Abrams came in and within the matter of 15 minutes changed tactics and strategy, which um, I, I, I don't find at all um, convincing. Then there's, there's a danger, I think, in terms of thinking about history that way, um, and especially a history that is so American-centric. Right. And, it, and it resonates, doesn't it, with yeah, the, we the want military? Yeah, we want to that. We want mil- to believe that, right? Absolutely. The military propensity to believe that, you know, if you leadership alone by force of will can can turn the ship and, uh, and and change things. I mean, that's beat into us. And in some cases, that's a good thing. But it is. Right? It really does ignore complexity. And uh, when you look at the Iraq surge, you know, I've written a little bit about this. It, it's so obvious, like you mentioned, that people at the top of the Bush administration and at the top of a certain clique of army officers looked at Vietnam or looked at Iraq and saw, and saw Vietnam. And, right, right. Uh, you know, they saw the Democrats who were pushing against the war in 2006 that had just won the uh, swing election against the war, which was really sort of a uh, specifically an anti-war uh, election. And then they uh, they said, well, no, we're not going to do what, say, you know, Johnson did or, or what Nixon eventually did and, you know, Vietnamizing the war or Iraqifying the war. We're going to we're going to stay the course. And, and right. President Bush, of course, was willing to do that. It's, it's extraordinary uh, the way that they drew those connections. And, and that narrative that doesn't go away. Uh, that narrative doesn't go away. In 2009, when I was there as a command historian for MNCI, and, and we were leaving Iraqi cities, as I mentioned in the introduction to withdrawal, the, the one book on Vietnam that's on the commander's um, professional reading list is, is A Better War. So even in 2009, when we know that we are not going to achieve um, success in the traditional military sense, um, that there's not going to be a, a victory as, as we would hope. We're still believing that a savior general will come in and save the war. Yeah, it's, it's really incredible. Well, Larry, what's your experience been like uh, with the Vietnam War and, and how you, you know, you've remembered it and people have you know, discussed it with you? Well, I'd like to I'd like to touch on one little point here before I before I forget it. Um, I've always liked reading about General Patton, and these days the the successes and failings of George S. Patton are are there's the historic ones, and then everything else we can attach to his legend. I remember General Casey being a rock star among my fellow soldiers when he was when he was in charge of the of the army back in 05 i feel like that there 
what I'm trying to key on is that that, that intele intellectual separation we have from the myths. It's easy for junior enlisted guys like me to want to believe in that General Casey's going to come in, he's going to kick ass, he's going to do this, General Abrams is going to come in and totally wipe the whole strategy, but at, at a certain point, we're not having the academic discussion anymore. We're talking about sending real people to die, and I think that the that because we've become so attached to our legends, to our movies, to our Black Hawk Downs, to our Saving Private Ryans, to, and, and the reason I brought up Patton was when he pushed the Third Army into Bastogne, I remember in the movie, you know, they made it seem huge, you know, I'll do it in 72 hours. And those are the kind of things that the American people want from us, and it's impossible in combat. But unless you take an intellectual look at warfare from that standpoint, you're always going to have the haves and have-nots, or the would and would-nots, that are going to say, we could have won, we could have done whatever, but the movie that I specifically thought about for Vietnam was We Were Soldiers. I've never looked into it too much behind the entire um, history around the movie, but if you were just to take the movie, just the feelings that are put out there in it of wounded soldiers, of taking a hill, charge the hill. I've never been asked to charge a hill in my whole fucking life, including in training, but we think of those things, and we attach ourselves to them, to, to, to things of legend and things that are not, not real. And it's that much easier for leaders, for officers that are in command, when the whole army wants to go, where are you going to go? You know, and they might even consider it a betrayal of their troops, you know. How did you pull out? How could you possibly have pulled out? Like, combat is a plus or minus scenario. Like, it can just be easily decided. We flipped the coin, we sent the right general, and we're done. And warfare is not that kind of calculus. Yeah, I think it especially in, in the context of places like Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan, there are, there are so comparatively fewer opportunities for heroic leadership in the in the form of a Patton. And it's no small coincidence, I would, I would argue, that uh, the tank battalion commander that leads Patton's army to relieve the, the siege troops at Bastogne is a young lieutenant colonel by the name of Creighton Abrams. Holy shit. <laughs> so that, that sense of uh, heroic leadership is still present in the, in the army um, during the Vietnam years, and I think is still with us today, right? That um, we all admire someone like Hal Moore, um, both in person and I think as presented in the movie. Um, you know, Westmoreland himself call, calls the Battle of Ai Drang an unprecedented victory um, that seemingly proves that the, the capacity of, of the American fighting man is, um, is, is right in line and up to par their World War II generation fathers. Um, the problem, I think, in, in these modern wars that, that are either unconventional or a mixture of conventional and unconventional, you don't, don't have that kind of clear-cut opportunity for, for a Joshua Chamberlain to prove himself at Little Round Top or a patent to make these major decisions that will have Incredible impact almost immediately on the on the course of the campaign, and I think that's frustrating. I think it's frustrating for not only the commanders, but I think also frustrating for the soldiers themselves who are fighting and trying to reconcile how their sacrifices mean mean something in the larger picture. So it's, it's the soldiers who are surrounded at Bastogne and the Hundred Post. Um, are looking for an opportunity or a way to reconcile their sacrifices, they can do so by saying that we were the, the Americans who, who stunted Hitler's final drive into the Ardennes, that we actually helped move the Allies closer to victory. And I think it's difficult, I think, in wars like Afghanistan, you can't do that. www.fortressonahill.com you can also find us on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill or on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash Fortress on a Hill. We want to hear from our listeners about the topics and issues pertinent to America's military and veteran communities. And last but certainly not least, analyze your news and its sources very closely. Verify everything you read. <laughs>
and remember that no one, no matter how powerful, are above criticism, especially those with the power to send others into harm's way. We'll see you next time.